Welcome to Boston Basic Income. I'm Alex Howlett. Uh, this week we are talking about to what extent uh, basic income, to what extent it makes sense for basic income to go to children, or whether it, if we're giving a, a cash benefit to children, should we even call that basic income? That kind of thing. Uh, some of us read uh, a blog post called The Case for Extending Basic Income to Children by Christine Rowe on the Forbes blog, con contributor blog thing. Uh, so I guess the, the question I want to start with uh, for everyone is um, just that question I just asked. To what extent does it make sense for basic income to go to children? Um, and does it make sense to call it basic income if it's a cash benefit that's, that's going toward children? Uh, Steve, you want to start us off? Um, well, uh, if the UBI went to children, then the UBI would be more universal. And I think that the universal is an appeal of UBI, and more universal is better. Okay. Nick? Yeah, I didn't, I haven't read this argument yet, uh, but, um, yeah, I, I feel kind of ambivalent about it, but I, basically I think it's better to err on the side of giving it to more people and sort of drawing an arbitrary line at 18 or something like that, I think is, it's kind of unsatisfying somehow. Yeah. Even though I do see some pitfalls. I mean, I have some worries about you know, doing it from birth, but. Yeah. Um, looking forward to the discussion. Yeah. Uh, Richard. I think it's better to start with children, but it, you have to do what's politically possible and Adding the, to the cost, even though you argue that money doesn't really matter, the cost of things doesn't really matter, debt uh, is well, a political non-starter, just like people thinking that basic income is a political non-starter, but the, with uh, Mitt Romney and uh, I forget the, the um, Democratic Michael Bennett? Oh. Um, they want to have a $1,500 basic thing. Um, child benefit per year, so yeah. maybe it's not as impossible as one would think, but that's not very much. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think it's certainly possible. Uh, uh, the question is, um, to what extent it would, um, I guess, benefit society to, to have it set up this way. Um, so I've certainly uh, run into people who, um, you know, talk about uh, Canada's child tax credit and they say, oh, there's a country, you know, like our neighbor to the north already has a form of basic income because they give an unconditional cash uh, benefit uh, for all children. Uh, and then, but then in my head, I'm like, does that really count as a basic income? Because the way I think about basic income in terms of the, the problem it solves is it allows people to participate in the market as consumers. Are you know infants and and two year olds participating in the market as consumers? Um, so so part of me wants to say, well, maybe it makes sense to pay a child uh, benefit, a child a, a cash benefit to children or to families who are raising children, but maybe I don't want to call it basic income because I feel like it's for a different purpose. Uh, Bethany, do you have any initial thoughts on basic income and in children? Yeah, um, I do. So I think that giving people a basic income or giving children a basic income especially to the degree that it's large versus small it might affect people's incentives to have kids which we've talked about in here before so i guess that's yes. the first thing that i think about um and and we talked in here a long time ago I don't know who, who was here about how we've actually reached peak child and the, and the population is on track to stabilize in the world which is a really good thing i think in terms of just exponential growth versus stabilization makes a big difference in sustainability. And I think some of what's driving that, if you if you watch at least the talk that we assigned for that uh, meetup, seems to be the economic benefit to having fewer children. People often still want to have some, but but there's uh, they can be more prosperous when they have fewer children, and that can drive a desire to have two children, three children, one child instead of six. Um, and yeah. so we don't know for sure how a basic income would affect this, but one thing I would be thinking about is would giving people money per kid change that? Because right now, most people's income from work is not scaled per kid. Um, and so if, if basic income became a big part of how people were making their money, and they also got it for the kids, 
would we destabilize the population of the world again is kind of the question right. that comes to mind quickly for me. So it's a really it's a really interesting question, the incentive question, because if I said to everyone, hey, if you have a kid, I'll give you a million dollars. Yeah. You know, a lot of people are going <laughs> to totally. start having kids. Yeah. Uh, so there is that effect. But there's also this interesting effect of poverty mm -hmm. where when people are poorer, they tend to have more kids, too. Yeah. So you've got these two competing effects where if you give people more money, maybe they're less poor and maybe they have other things to be excited about in life besides having kids, but then you are still technically paying them to have children. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that that trade-off feels more direct to me in terms of just giving people a basic income in general, because right. that would give them more money to potentially raise kids, but it would also give, you know, reduce poverty or they could still be better off with fewer kids. Whereas if you're paying people directly to have the kids, that seems like a more targeted incentive. Right. Um, to have kids. And of course, it depends on how big it is compared to the cost of the kid, too, right, in terms of the level of, of influence, the amount of influence. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to get to some comments on the live stream, and then we'll go to Richard. Um, so my mom says, I don't think it makes sense for it to go to children because it's really going to parents. Like any mm -hmm. kind of child benefit, there would need to be oversight on how it's spent. So I think it's true that um, it would really be going to parents. Mm -hmm. I don't know necessarily that we'd need oversight on how it was spent unless there was like this epidemic of parents not taking care of their children or something like that. And then you might need to have something in place to help specific parents who are not able to be good parents or something like that. I think generally speaking, when parents have money, they know how to spend that money to, you know, the benefit of their children, that kind of thing. That's usually not a problem. Um, Phoenix Congress says, unless basic income is high enough to lift all families out of poverty without uh, a kid's dividend, it should absolutely include them. So I think this kind of comes back to the question of uh, what is basic income for? Um, and then what are the resources that we have um, available in our society? Um, so if we imagine, you know, like we talk about in here, that there's some kind of natural level of basic income that the economy can sustain and allow the markets to be efficient and that kind of thing, um, then you're either in an economy that has the resources to make it so that nobody's in poverty and you know families who have children are not in poverty, et cetera, et cetera, or you're in an economy that doesn't have those resources. So then you have to make trade-offs. Mm -hmm. Do you pri prioritize um, children over other people? You know that kind of thing. Um, you know if you can't if you can't afford to make everyone not poor. Uh, so that's that's a question too. I don't think we're in that situation, but but yeah. Um, and uh, Eddie is on the live stream. He says, I think it makes sense uh, for it to go to adults. Children are dependents. They're not expected to work or make money. And I think that's that's right. And and obviously, if we have a, a basic income at a high enough level, maybe nobody's expected to work or make money. But people are still, you know, at least adults are expected to participate in the market as consumers and children are not going to be expected to do that, at least not directly. Like, like parents, like their, you know, decisions are being made for them by their parents. And obviously this, you know, there's, it's not like suddenly a switch flips and that's not true anymore. As they get older, they become more autonomous. So I could imagine something like phasing in the basic income as the children get older too. Um, uh, so Richard, do you have a comment? Well, most Western, uni uni um, Western European countries have a, a child benefit, and France is a really weird one. We have to have at least two children to have a, a child benefit. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about, well, harkening back to Thomas Paine last week, you can have a, a large like cash benefit that, or grants or whatever that goes to children when they're like fifty thousand dollars or something when they reach age uh, age eighteen, uh, sort of like when the instead of twenty one with Thomas Dean. Yeah, like the baby bonds type thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I think they kind of kind of uh, lump some benefit at age of maturity. Um, it doesn't make as much sense for in terms of like the efficiency of the benefit. Um, the, you know, uh, Native American tribes do. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, it is something that's done. Uh, the question is, I guess, whether it, um, whether it solves the problems of, you know, people being able to, to get the most out of the economy as well as something like a basic income. Would. Native American tribes have an issue with the children 
uh, spending it all on cars or something like that. Yeah, I mean that kind of thing. If it's a basic income, then and then you get it, you know, every month or every however often you get it, and say you waste that money, you still got more money coming. So you're not, you can't just, mm -hmm. you know, turn eighteen and waste it all on cars. So so that's a that's a big. Um, but they part still of get the six thousand dollars a year or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, that's pretty good. I think it would make more sense if it was. Um, it would make more sense if they just didn't have the lump sum, and then maybe they had a higher, uh, you know, regular regular payout or something like that. Um, so uh, Mitchell Mitchell it, Mitchell's comment is: if it is universal uh, basic income, would wouldn't that be to all? And and yeah, I mean, like universal implies all, and basic implies it's something basic that everyone gets. Um, so yeah, it, it implies that it goes to all, but then all of who? Is it all you know adults, all fully autonomous members of society? Um, and and my intuition is that that yes, that's the kind of the all who we are talking about uh, when we talk about basic income and the the dynamics of how a child benefit works is is different because you're you're not directly you know the child's uh, uh, resources are being managed by someone else, uh, so it's not it's. This it's not like ch children are you know full full adult people right, mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of like my hesitation to say like oh a child is a person which is true therefore it should go to um, a child. Um, is that yeah. phased in thing with you or really thought of or you think you get like ten dollars a week or something like that and they can go spend it on whatever they want and they can learn through that. Yeah, I could imagine it phasing in, like, you know, at age 10, you start getting a little bit and then a little bit more each year, that kind of thing, until you have the full basic income when you're 18 or something like that. Yeah. Uh, that would make sense to me. Um, I want yeah. to just to Phoenix ahead. point, like, in terms of the question of what we do if the basic income is there is pretty low in general, and, and I would think there might be a, still a, a conceptual reason to separate the idea of the basic income from the idea of whatever is given to help children, like you might still want that to be a separate program. And right. the reason I might personally want that is that, it, it, for me at least, as if the basic income were able to be increased over time, at a certain point you might find that the child benefit is no longer needed. So if they're separate, it's easier to phase it out eventually, which again, I have the reasons I mentioned for kind of thinking that might be a good idea. Whereas if the basic income always goes to children, they're just kind of an inertia to that, and it's less, it's less likely that that feature of it would ever be phased out, even as it got higher. Yeah, I mean, if nobody's in danger of, of, of having a kid and that, like, pushing them over the edge into poverty or something like that, um, then you can imagine that people would be making a calculation as to whether they want to pay the cost of having a child. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, that, that could seem perfectly reasonable. They're not going to, like, end up destitute or something if they have a child, but maybe they won't have as much freedom or flexibility or yeah. as much, you know, uh, disposable income or, or something right. like that and then you can tweak you can tweak that amount too like if um, you know I, I think I'm imagining that in any case if you do have a child benefit it's not going to be about um, okay there was child poverty before you had the child benefit and now what the, the problem the child benefit is solving is is the problem of child poverty mm -hmm. um, in a world where you have like a really high basic income it's more just a slight incentive effect yeah. Um, um, yeah, I, sorry. yeah, but uh, I do want to point out that um, part of the argument for cash benefits going to children is the idea that, you know, uh, a child's parents might be poor, <coughs> but, you know, that child didn't choose to have those parents, so there's no reason why, you know, the child should be forced to grow up poor. Mm -hmm. So even if you're not uh, even if you ordinarily wouldn't provide a benefit to the parents or couldn't provide a benefit to the parents, maybe we can afford to support children in some ways, maybe through direct cash and maybe through other things. Yeah. Um, so, so that's an argument for targeting benefits toward children. But I, I still think of this as kind of a separate thing from basic income. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wanted to also point out that, um, in, I don't know about France, but in some countries they actually want people to have more kids. So their incentive within the country is a little bit different in terms of whether they want to increase the population or decrease it. Um, but internationally, I think most people still want the population to be pretty stable internationally rather than exponentially growing. There might be people who disagree with that. That would be interesting. What's the name of the person who gave that talk, by the way? I should give You're talking about Hans Rosling? Yeah, so Hans Rosling has great talks on, on the stabilization of population. Um, yeah. and, and so that's kind of what I, where I'm getting a lot of my information. But and interestingly, what he points out is that 
most of the developed countries in the world do have fairly stable populations. They're not growing exponentially mm -hmm. or something like that. And that all of the remaining population growth is coming from uh, poorer countries uh, in places like Africa. Oh, it's more than that, though. What? The, wait, sorry. I think. Yeah, go ahead. The, the poorer countries also have stabilized the population. It doesn't look like it's stabilizing because people are aging. But the number of kids is still about two. On net, in the yeah. whole global, um, you know, global population, you know, the, the birth rate has stabilized. Yeah. There are some countries where population is still growing really fast. Yeah. But a lot of the, a lot of the, even the poor countries, as you pointed out, have stabilized. Yeah. yeah. And the reason the population is growing is just because they stabilize the birth rate later in time, and there's this lag as people right. age. So the yeah. the point that I that I wanted to make there um, was that just the connection between um, poverty and population growth. Mm -hmm. So so there's so again, there's this um, there's this poverty effect where if you uh, spend money to eliminate poverty, even though you're giving people maybe more money and more money for their children, and that kind of thing that can counterintuitively lower the birth rate as well. Yeah. But one thing that he yeah. points out is like the thing he really emphasizes is child mortality, right. which is related to poverty. But also right. when you look at his case studies in terms of why people are choosing to have fewer kids, there is a strong emphasis on the economics. So in, even in schools, they're teaching people like if you have five kids or four kids, you're not going to have enough food, like you're going to be this and that. If you have two kids, you're going to be better off financially. So it does seem like po quite possible to me that if you started paying per kid, that would change that dynamic a little bit or enough to destabilize the population. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's always these effects. Like I was saying before, if you yeah. just give everyone a million dollars per kid, they're going to have a lot of kids because you know yeah. that's millions of dollars. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so so you gotta you gotta kind of balance these two effects. But I'm saying uh, that effect might be strong. And but your effect is you can do quite easily without paying people per kid. So I don't know why you keep bringing up this idea of lowering poverty. Uh, Unless you think that like the yeah. I don't wait, what do you mean? Out. What do you, well hold hold on. What are you saying? Well, you keep saying lowering poverty can decrease the birth rate. Right. And so I guess you think the basic income would be so low that you would need to give it to kids to lower poverty. Is that why you're bringing that up? Otherwise, doesn't just a regular basic income not given to kids? I'm talking about in in a world without basic income. Mm. If you've got child poverty, then giving a, a benefit to children, cash benefit to or families with children, um, can uh, can can potentially reduce the birth rate. Can, yeah, but there'd right. be more efficient ways if you were interested in that, like like targeting maternal care and child survival. Yeah, sure, um, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but and, but that's and, the only thing I'm interested in, I'm just saying. Right, but I mean, if your goal is to kind of eliminate the, the child poverty, um, uh, and you're worried that giving people money for having children is going to kind of cause them to have even more ch more children, at that level of effect, you know, when it's when you're going from poverty to no no poverty anymore, um, that would actually reduce the birth rate. Is, mm -hmm. is all I'm saying. I'm not sure. I'm not no, sure. I think this has been pretty well established. That just giving it to the kids still reduces the birth rate. That's been established. Well, you give it to the family that yeah. is having the kids. Yeah, that's been established. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it would depend on how poor the situation is to begin with. I guess right. that's what you're saying. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah, the, the, there's a there's a line where once you yeah. cross it, giving people money to have children uh, actually will make them have more children. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. But I guess I'm, and I don't want to take up too much time, but yeah. I guess I'm always comparing it to an alternative in my mind, because as we talk about, right. you always have different options in terms of how to spend that money. Um, so there's always other options rather than paying people per kid. You could just pay each adult, or you could right. pay for child health care, or you know, there's different options. Yeah, uh, so my mom says, I don't even know how child poverty is something on its own. It's family poverty. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think that's right. The reason child poverty is something on its, on its own or why we talk about it as something on its own is because um, in our society, we think of children as innocent. So when children are poor, that's a real problem. When their parents are poor, you know, we're like, oh, well, they brought it on themselves or something like that. So we really think of child poverty as this problem on its own. But it is family poverty. It's the whole family that's poor. It's not yeah. just the children. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Richard, go ahead. Well, countries like Russia, uh, China, and Japan have, well, don't have, are not having child um, population replacement levels. They're below 2%. Two per child, children per family, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And China, uh, Japan actually has, since they're so discriminatory against women, they most women don't even have children. Mm -hmm. And so they, maybe a child benefit would 
induce them to, but I don't think so. Yeah. I actually expected not to go to back to work after they have children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you, so sometimes you need to make other changes too. There are countries that try to, um, you know, pay a child benefit to get, uh, get people to have more children, like we were saying before. Um, yeah, um, but if, if, you're, if you're providing a benefit, but you're also imposing this huge cost, sometimes mm -hmm. you know, that cost is gonna stand in the way of the effects of the, the incentive effects of the benefit. Uh, so Eddie says, I could see it as a societal awareness education tool. Mm -hmm. If kids get some allowance from the government, I bet they'll be paying attention to politics before they can even vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's right. I think uh, you know, kids are going to notice if the government, uh, if some politician or something wants to pay, wants to take away their allowance. That's kind of uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of a big deal. And I think it's also a big deal, uh, you know, even if their parents are getting basic income. You know, that might not, you know hand them money directly um, the way the way an, an allowance would if they're old enough to spend their own money but it still affects their lives greatly that kind of thing yeah um, Phoenix Congress points out uh, children are consumers even if not directly in 2015 the cost of raising a newborn to 18 was two hundred forty one thousand and eighty dollars or thirteen thousand three hundred ninety three dollars a year uh, that's uh, an interesting statistic uh, that could be useful to people who uh, want to be able to plan that kind of thing. Uh, I think uh, I think that's right. Um, the question is, um, in terms of what what problem you're trying to solve, if you if if parents are typically the ones who get the income, then having a child can be something that they budget for, something that they, that they kind of plan for. Mm -hmm. um, and as Bethany was pointing out, if, if you are increasing the benefit when people have children, then that changes those calculations. And these calculations might not even be conscious things, but you know, it, it, it certainly, there is an incentive effect there. Um, okay. Yeah. Again, I mean, not, maybe some people aren't worried about global population, which is fine, but just like I said, in, in India, in this, in this video, they, they were very explicitly talking about, it's not that they would have no children, but that the two children they did have would have more resources right. than if they had five or six children. And that seemed to be a very conscious part of Actually, that was Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Oh, Bangladesh. It's I'm Bangladesh, sorry, you're right. Yeah, yeah I, I, I misremembered. Um, anyway, so, so, yeah. so that's kind of what I mean. You could think of it as the parent's expense or as the child being a consumer, but to me it seems more natural in a way to think of it as a parent's expense. I think so too, because the child is not autonomous yet, mm -hmm. especially when they're younger. And then yeah. that gradually changes. Uh, Nick, go ahead. Uh, what I was thinking about is it would be interesting to try to apply the lens that I think we often apply in here of you know, thinking of the basic income as enabling a better allocation of resources of like what the economy can Produce right. to people, and, and think about like how that applies to young people, mm -hmm. because I, don't know, I guess I'm the sort of mom my mic is like my 13 year old son is really into rock climbing, it's like a little bit of an expensive hobby, you know, he's got a membership at the gym and he's on a team, and so he's like paying the coaches and wanting to go on these outings and buy gear, and um, like I think that if the argument is good for using that kind of mechanism to uh, allocate resources in the economy for adults, like, you know, does that also apply? Wouldn't it also be a good mechanism for the things that 17 year olds and 16 year olds and 15 year olds right. want access to? And, um, uh, but, I, but I do think it's, I mean, I am a little worried. Like, so I think the parents have the incentives. Yeah. The parents so, want their, chil their children to work or something like that so they can earn money so that they can be rock climbers or whatever. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, uh, independent of that, like when we talk, we talk about in here, like, you know, forcing people to earn or to, to work in order to, as an excuse to earn money is not necessarily the efficient thing. So, so kind of to your point, uh, Nick, I think the answer is, is, I don't know how you framed it as, you asked, you asked a yes or no question. The, the, the answer is either yes or no, depending on how you <laughs> asked it. Um, but I think, you know, 17 year old kids are, they're almost 18 year old adults, right? right. There's, there's not like a clear dividing line uh, when someone becomes an yeah. adult. Uh, so I would imagine that 
um, you know, even your 13 year, 13 year old son in a lot of ways is making decisions on his own about what he wants to do. Um, and if he had money, he would be deciding how to spend it on his own. You know, that's kind of, so, so, you know, the, I think it's more a question of when do you phase it, f start phasing in the basic income, how rapidly that kind of thing, you know, and that's based on some judgment about, well, when are, how rapidly do kids start to become more autonomous in their lives in terms of making their own decisions about how to allocate yeah. their resources or be consumers, that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. it seems tricky. Like, it yeah. seems like we want to, if, if we're going to rely on this mechanism, mechanism yeah. for help, help for the economy to decide, to decide like, like how many tennis shoes to make, how yeah. many right. cars, it, it should also decide how many youth climbing teams we yeah. need in Boston. Yeah. Uh, and we want there to be enough. And, and I think that's right. Uh, yeah. And I think, it, like, oh, like for a newborn, though, you could see how it's different from the 13-year-old. Yeah. Like, the newborn can't participate directly in the economy to tell the economy to give it toys or something. Like, it has right. to go through the parents. It doesn't have the ability to walk right. into a store. And at some point, the person has the ability to, like, your son can make his own spending yeah. choices. So I think there's some zone, you know what I mean? There's, like, a gradual transition towards making one's own spending yeah. choices. And like a three-year-old might technically be able to make one's own spending choices, but do we really want the three, I know it's an interesting question, like should right. the three-year-old really be like deciding? Of buying, buying yeah, now. yeah. <laughs> like should, should they really be taking a full chunk of the economy the way that an adult would, for, and maybe that would even be irresponsible for their own health or safety. Or, right. You know, so, so I think there's like this gradual shift to adulthood in terms of the consumer role. At least that's how I see it. I don't, you know, I'm not, you have kids of your own, so you might right. have a different perspective. It's kind of, I think it's, I think it's very tricky. I mean, a couple of thoughts occurred to me. Like, one, one is, what if there were sort of, what if they got a basic income in some different kind of token? Mm -hmm. You could only spend on sort of somehow approved <laughs> like a Like or, a filtered YouTube or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that is problematic. But, um, or... But, but I think it also, it also leads down this other, I think, problematic question, which is like, if a 13-year-old only deserves 20% of the resources because they're not fully participating or you know, not allowed, being, not being allowed to participate fully, like, yeah, where's the line? And, and how come we're going to say, oh, all, but all adults deserve exactly equal? Yeah. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's less about deserve. I mean, it's tricky, right? Because there's something, again, by necessity with the newborn. And it's not that the newborn deserves less resources, but the, the parents control the resources, right? And yeah. we kind of, like, there was this issue of trust going on in terms of the online platform. But in general, we kind of trust the parents to, to buy the appropriate things for the newborn. And as a general thing, that sort of works because I think, you know, evolution and whatever, like, people care for their kids for the most part. But, you know, obviously it breaks down at some level but but i think the the 13 year old if they only got a small percentage of the basic income that doesn't mean other expenses like that doesn't mean their parents aren't also spending on them from the economy right. it's yeah. just the question of like so i wouldn't think of it as like moral dessert so much as what's appropriate for them to choose themselves right. versus have their parents control and i think this is kind them. of yeah. a specific case of the fact that it's always true that we need to do things differently with children mm. right uh, and and that it's tricky to, to figure it out, and they're always they're they're growing and changing mm -hmm. so quickly, and not all at the same rate, and you know mm -hmm. like that kind of thing. Some seven year olds are much more able to spend on themselves than other seven year olds. Sure, or something <laughs> yeah, probably. yeah. Um, and 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 I think that's a big part of why I kind of think at the child end of the spectrum, a lot of the concerns there are not the same concerns we think about when we think about basic income or or there's more there's more complexity there like we have to figure out uh you know what makes sense for children you know how do we best support children in the society that kind of thing yeah. uh it feels like a separate problem from the problem basic income solves i think i would yeah. acknowledge that like even among adults obviously there's a continuum of how much we might think from the outside that they're benefiting themselves or not with their spending but i do think we kind of have to draw the line somewhere partly and also there's no one else that's naturally looking out for them like they might have a relative kind of parenting them but they might not so it's still a different situation than the kids where you're if you give the basic income to their parents a lot of the time they're going to be spending that on the kids right if you have an irresponsible adult and and you were to not give them full basic income who else is necessarily going to spend it on on them you know what i mean like i guess you could have cases with like caregivers which we do have for some adults cases like, with caregivers 
I mean, maybe I'm not making sense. I'm trying to go on this idea. You You're talking about a dependent, a, a dependent adult. Yeah. So we do yeah. have like other designations, like older adults or, or any adult who we don't think can really make it his or her own right. decisions could have like a person by proxy that I guess can, in this case kind of controlled their basic income partly for them. Um, yeah. Or so like so that, I think, but. yeah, I mean, I think there are, you know, there are problems that basic income doesn't solve. Mm -hmm. And certainly if people are unable to be autonomous humans mm -hmm. participating in the market, basic income is not going to solve that problem. And that right. applies to uh, adult dependents and it also applies to, to children as like well. Like if they don't have the parents taking care of them or the parents aren't doing a satisfactory job or something like that. Yeah. 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 Uh, I just want to point out oh. that uh, <laughs> Nick is echoing. Uh, as far as I know, it's only really Nick. Uh, oh, is it this microphone? I guess it's that microphone. Uh, I, I don't know, um, you know, like, I don't want to try to fix it because it's going to, you know, like, that's probably going to be more trouble than it's worth. <laughs> so as long as you guys can, like, make out what he's saying and it's not too bad, um, I'm going to just let it be what it is. Yeah. Uh, but go ahead. I can turn the volume down. Um, Okay, one crazy idea, kind of thought experiment, to take away the incentive mm -hmm. for people to have kids is that you would decouple the, decouple things somehow so mm -hmm. that you'd like assign babies to live with random people. <laughs> <laughs> or yeah. you assign random people to kind of be the like trustee of that kid's basic income. Mm, that's interesting. Or you can yeah. have like parental licensure. Where uh, unfit parents are sterilized or something, they oh, can't yeah. have children. This is all starting to sound very brave and <laughs> yeah. to me. Um, or prison for people who have more than two kids. I think oh, I think you're coming up with with <laughs> solutions that are causing more problems than yeah. they solve. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, um, well, you know, full disclosure, you know, I study kind of like evolutionary origins of human behavior. So, like for me the idea of separating kids from their biological parents doesn't sound like a great idea. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. um, Intuitively, it feels like it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> Most people think, but I mean, I think without that, you know, you could have the intuition. Why not? Some people do. But anyway, I, I, I strongly yeah. disagree with that idea. But I read about yeah. a cult in the 60s that was into that. Really? There have been, yeah. And there was um, the Oneida community in the 1800s was into that. Um, and obviously communists did a little bit of that and the kibbutzim did a little bit of that. So it's been tried, you know, to some degree it's been tried. Um, leave child raising to the professionals. Yeah, leave it to the, and, and some of it's more like just the di the daycare is, is, is put in a communal way, but sometimes like people weren't really allowed to see their kids. Like in the United mm. Community, they could only visit once a week. And this seemed to be quite sad Whoa. for the parents. Yeah. It's sort of like um, boarding school. Yeah. Um, yeah, or, or <laughs> fostering among noble families in the, yeah, so in the in the Old 17 days. up until the 1700s at least in France a lot of people sent their kids away to like even to England without much transportation between and the kids were doing very poorly as you might imagine like also cuz the poorer people were, were sending them to people who were caring for like 12 kids at a time with like not that much money but even the wealthy people's kids were doing really badly. This is probably because of how it was implemented, but it also doesn't seem to be very good psychologically for kids, uh, you know, or, but it's interesting that people at that time didn't, even the wealthy who had the option, didn't seem that interested in sometimes in raising their own kids. This was oh. partly cultural because of the whole, like, you're supposed to be an intellectual in the salon, et cetera, so even the women, and also partly, obviously, they didn't have perhaps reliable birth control, so who knows if they wanted that kid in the first place. But this is why they started, like, this whole daycare system in France that still exists today. That's really quite good, actually. But it was because these kids were being, like, very mistreated and up and they were dying on route and dying there, and it was just like a huge disaster. So there have been different historical moments um, with different experimental options. Um, in Oneida, it was interesting because the benefits were there too. Obviously, like the women had a much more equal gender role than the men in that community, um, which was enabled partly by not having to raise children. Yeah, and the men also participated in raising the kids um, in terms of the communal raising. Mm -hmm. But I think countries have found other ways to allow for that, right? Like now France has like subsidized, you know, whatever, there's different ways to allow. I think there are ways to, to allow women to work and not force them not to see their kids. <laughs> I think there's other options. Sounds like something that's doable. <laughs> I feel like yeah. there's, a, there's a way. But anyway, um, this is probably a little off. But, but you could have somebody else be the trustee of the money. I think the disadvantage of, I mean, you're probably joking anyway, but the disadvantage of that is like the parents are very intimately motivated to care for their kids and connected to their kids, they probably know how to spend the money a lot better than 
some random person who would then kind of have to become connected to the kid to even figure out what to do. Yeah. It doesn't seem like, yeah. I mean, yeah, the incentive thing is tricky, but it seems to me possible that there would be at least a way to phase it in in the teens that wouldn't create too much incentive to have a lot of kids. Um, that would destabilize the population. I see. I feel like there could be. Yeah, I would imagine there. that you wouldn't. You you could start phasing it in pretty young, and mm-hmm. you know, like a few years of of not not getting a benefit for the kid would, you know, like be most of difference. most of the incentive yeah, effect would be, be right there. Yeah, could be. Yeah. It could even be a phased in right away, but very very small amounts. Yeah. Or, yeah. Who knows? Like yeah. along with what Bethany was talking about, um, Attila the Hun and and various other people were. Uh, exchange between the Roman Empire and like the Huns and things like that, so that they could have political stability between the different. Oh, like tribes. intermarrying or something? Like no, not they'd exchange there. children. Yeah, exchange oh, they exchange children. children. Political hostages. Oh, interesting. So they they wouldn't attack each other. It's like a non-aggression tax. Oh, sort of that's thing. an interesting. It's like in Game of Thrones. Interesting strategy. Is that what they do? I think there's some instances. Yeah. Instances yeah. Of that yeah. In game. Right. Huh. So political pawnage of the children is another option. Yeah. <laughs> so does anyone have any more comments before we get to the article? Uh, uh, no, I guess I just yeah. want to reiterate that I think a lot of the way people currently think about child benefits does have to do with the kind of moral framework that you were bringing up. Like right. the children don't deserve to be poor and by extension the adults do kind of or do more. I don't think it's always that. I mean sometimes it's just that we care about the fact that they're so vulnerable and right. they're being in a very like transformative time of their life, but I think right. there also is this moral framing, like you said, of yeah. not really deserving it um, when you're little. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the first one, uh, I probably could pronounce this correctly, uh, Almaz Zalecki is a political science professor at NYU Shanghai who has studied basic income for many years. She believes that an American UBI needs to include children who are cut out of Yang's plan. Only basic income that goes to children as well as adults can actually eliminate the poverty of families with only a single parent or a single earner, Zalecki argues. So this is an interesting point because obviously if you are a single parent, the, uh, the cost of raising a child is higher per parent because there's only yeah. one of you. Yeah. No, but but I, oh, that okay. can create an incentive to separate your the two parents from each other, so that you can get more child benefits or basic income or whatever. Well, there'd still only be one child, right? Yeah, they do it based on the child. But I think he yeah. was saying if you if you instead gave like single parents more money, that would create weird incentives. Uh, that's actually what happens in with the Canadian child benefit. They give, oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They give more money to single parents. Well, so they, they or they give a, the same, or wait. They give more money to uh, singular parents, so they have an incentive to separate, so they get, get mm-hmm. more money. And so if they separate each parent, gets more money? Or one of them gets more money. Or one of them gets more money. Or w- one of them, right, because the one, one, the, the one the that children. gets to raise the kid, yeah, gets get, gets the money for the kid. Yeah. yeah. That makes, so, yeah, so that can be an issue um, with a certain, certainly, yeah, with a, with a, uh, uh, a child cash benefit. Um, whoever controls the child controls the money. Mm-hmm. Um, That's not good. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say like it seems like she's they're assuming a certain amount here. Like maybe they're assuming like Yang's thousand dollars a month because it kind of seems like her argument is is about the concern we were talking about, including Phoenix, that you wouldn't raise them out of poverty. Right. Um, and I think she's probably just imagining like, well, two thousand dollars a month might raise a family out of poverty with a kid, but not one thousand. Kind of right. seems like that's her argument there, and she's um, imagining it as like an anti-poverty program instead mm-hmm. of just this is the way the economy works efficiently. Or something that's like true that. too. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, not that poverty isn't being caused by the economy working inefficiently, but but yeah. Um, well, it's, it's, she's uh, even worse than that. She's choosing a particular kind of person in poverty, um, which can get start a conversation on what kind of people are. The most in poverty, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. which is, I think is we can avoid by saying that the whole that it's universal, and we we're going to not have a competition, an audition to mm-hmm. see who is who needs the money the most. Yeah, I think that's right. Right. 
Yeah, it, it's interesting because she's, from her perspective, she's arguing for more universality. Like it also goes to children, mm. um, but it also, um, since children are not, you know, their own autonomous uh, individuals, it yeah. creates this incentive problem with with parents, you know, mm -hmm. wanting to take control of the child because they they get the money for it yeah. or that kind of thing. Yeah. And also, yeah, oh, yeah, she had just said, uh, I think it should be given to children because children are, are just consumers, like all all of Yang's adults. So mm -hmm. just uh, include mm -hmm. children. That would be a different right. argument. Yeah. That would have been they, a different argument. That would be mm -hmm. Yeah. Simpler. Yeah. Straightforward. And it would also have been wrong because <clears throat> children are not just like adult consumers. But that's more the debate we've been having, right, right. as opposed to the argument she made. Uh, yes, yes, that's right. That's there's right. also an, like, um, there's an issue with like, um, with like the, air, in the aristocracy where the parents die off and they want to, to, the people argue over the children so they can control the domain while, until they mm -hmm. reach the age, like the dowager and oh, right. and things. <clears throat> oh, yeah. right. Like they want to be the, the regent for the mm -hmm. for the king or something, like the child king. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, Phoenix Congress says uh, there's a chart of the Alaskan birth rate, mm. and it declines starting in 1982 when the oil dividend oh, began. So I think this is clearly an example of where the um, the poverty effect is dominating the yeah. incentive but, effect of but the. But would of the they give the oil dividend to kids? Does they do. Be? Oh, they do. So in Alaska, yeah. yeah, yeah. Thanks, Phoenix. That's an interesting. Yeah. Point. So that's an interesting mm -hmm. data point right there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I also just wanted to say that I think in addition to expecting it to be a certain amount, Zalecki presumably has in mind like basic income is kind of replacing other programs. Because otherwise she could just say like in addition to Yang's plan, you should have additional assistance for kids or something like that if they're not raised out of poverty. You see what I mean? Right. If there's this if, if there's this plan that's helping a lot of people, um, then you can say, okay, this is great, and we also need other things. You mm -hmm. wouldn't say we shouldn't have this plan. So there's some kind of like zero sum thinking going on. Yeah, here. and I think yeah. that's a little different from how you talk about it, where it's, you say like let's wait to eliminate other programs perhaps until we see that they're unnecessary, that kind of thing, or we could still have other programs that are necessary. So it seems like a different mindset than what she, even where she's coming from. Right. Well, it, uh, I think you could end the whole conversation by saying that uh, the kids are getting the UBI in the form of, of a free public school. Mm. So it's like we're giving them the $500 or $1,000 a month, and then we're taking it and paying for their public school. That's interesting. And so they're already getting it, and so there's nothing left to talk about. Yeah, that's the <laughs> universal <laughs> basic services thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, yeah I, suppose, I suppose that's a way to kind of kind of brush it aside. Um, there's other, oh, go ahead, did you want to say Yeah, I mean, just kind of uh, related to what you were saying before, if we imagine that there's a natural rate of basic income for the economy, and, you know, I usually talk about um, trying to calibrate the basic income to to get to that natural rate um, that's, that's optimal for markets and stuff. Um, then if you do that uh, for people over age 18, uh, then you can start thinking about, um, okay, well, you know, like, does it make sense to um, for more resources to go to other places and to influence mm -hmm. the market? So maybe lower the amount of basic income to increase the amount of child benefits that we give mm -hmm. or to phase it in earlier or something like that. Yeah. I mean, I think intuitively, if I were implementing a basic income from scratch, I would want to I would like want to make some guess about how to optimally phase it in mm -hmm. from the from the get go. Um, like, you know, maybe kids starting at age 10, you know, get a, a small amount and by the time they're 18, they get the full amount or something like that. I think, you know, like you'll probably get a pretty good result that way. And maybe you can do some tweaking and optimizing later. Um, but I think that, you know, it's a good starting point. Yeah. Yeah. I would think they're on a debit card or something like that. Yeah, exactly. I was going to just say that there are other kinds of trade-offs that are similar. Like, um, you, Steve, you made me think of this, like, like there's the question of whether to have, um, subsidized daycare or subsidized uh, child care before, you know, preschool, before kindergarten, those kinds of questions. So in, in France, they have a lot of that stuff. In the U.S., they don't. And it's been coming up in the debates. Right. Um, and again, if you think of the economy the way that you do, you might have to lower everybody's basic income a little bit to support that. And, and, it, and it has different effects that we might want or not want. Like maybe you want to encourage women to work or maybe you don't particularly like like it has those kinds of effects it right. has, or meant to work too like mine can be the child caregiver it has different kinds of effects and it's that, also a question of what's going to be optimally optimally allocated by the market mm -hmm. so um if you give parents money are they going to optimally allocate child care for their children right or 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 uh uh 
preschool for their children, that kind yeah. of thing. Are they gonna are they gonna buy that in the market? Or, yeah, or you know, would it be better to provide or it better this is just yeah. say okay, we're gonna lower the basic income a little bit mm -hmm. and provide these things that everyone gets. Yeah. Um, because we know that the market is not going to allocate right. those resources efficiently. In the case of the yeah. subsidy for a nanny, I guess they could just be an approved nanny in some way, but it's basically like giving people money they can only spend on a nanny. Right. And and that raises these questions of like, maybe that's really important. Like you want to encourage women to go back to work or men to go back to work, or you want to like make sure children have really good care. So you want to target the money that way. Yeah. Um, or maybe you don't, you know, maybe you'd rather just give people money and let them decide how to spend it. Like we've talked about that too. Like maybe you should be neutral as a government with respect to whether parents take care of their own kids or hire outside help. And a policy like subsidizing nannies kind of pushes them towards the outside work option. So I don't have a strong opinion about right. this, but I'm just pointing out that in addition to the child getting basic income directly, there's like these other trade-offs to make in terms of how to spend money yeah. um, that relate to childcare or having kids and the cost of having kids. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Yeah. You guys ready for the next one? Yeah. Um, um, regarding the child's share that goes to the parents. Yeah. Mm, oh, it's the Alaska. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. And then it's the same kind of thing where if the parents split up, then whoever has custody gets the money, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Interesting. Cool. I wonder, I don't know if you know Phoenix, but it'd be interesting to know whether they're was any increase in like official divorce rate or coupling or anything related to the kinds of points like or related to the kinds of like fight fighting over the kids that you talked about i don't know if it would have any kind of effect but i think it would be hard to measure that particular effect because yeah. it's going to be confounded by people having more money and it's less true. stress and yeah, that yeah, kind of yeah, thing okay, as well point. Yeah. that would be really hard to yeah. measure yeah um okay here's the next one uh this is related to the precarious finances of children and single parent families, as Zalecki explains. When you design a basic income, you have to make a choice. Are you targeting an individual or are you targeting a family? Her choice is firmly for the latter. I would prioritize a basic income that, in its design, is designed to lift single parent families, which are the most vulnerable families economically, to lift those families above, above the poverty threshold rather than individuals. So this is kind of like talking about targeting families rather than individuals is, is the opposite of how we think about basic income. Basic income is something that's individual. That's like part of the definition of basic income. Uh, so, so I think she's, she wants to tack this, um, this extra thing onto basic income because she sees, she sees a benefit that she wants to have but what she's talking about then isn't isn't basic income anymore. Yeah. yeah, I guess I'll just reiterate my other points. Is it seems like she's thinking more about like we have to choose a benefit program. The goal is to lift people out of poverty. How should we design it? Which right. is very different from how I usually think about basic income um, and how to design it. Right. Or we have like this this lump sum of money, uh, and we need to figure out how to optimally spend it. Like, what, what do we spend it on? She's kind of thinking from that perspective, too. Yeah, but even more than that, like, even if yeah. she was thinking from that perspective, she could still say, okay, let's allocate some of that towards a basic income that goes to all adults, right, and right. some of it towards a, a single family subsidy that helps the single, like, that helps the little last mile, I guess she thinks is going to be there to lift those single families out of poverty. That would be a more natural and, way to think about it for me if I had her concern. And that's that's true. And it's interesting, too, because she's talking about that's not what she's advocating. She's not she she talks about designing a program that lifts single parents out of families. But the way she wants to achieve that is providing a benefit that's attached to the child, which actually is way less efficient than what I just said. If you have her concerns, because now it goes to all the rich people's kids with kids, too which is kind of irrelevant to her goal of lifting the most vulnerable <laughs> families out of right. poverty. Like it seems like what she would want is something targeted to those particular situations. Right. That She's looks more like welfare we have now or, or but a better version of it. Or yeah. Something. I mean, one of the, one of the, the um, things that's really important about basic income is that it's not targeted so that you don't right. have to make these calculations. Exactly. About yeah. So, so I think she wants to get some of that effect of like oh, not having to calculate, um, who gets the benefit, uh, that kind of thing. Right, right. Uh, but still targeted in the sense that, you know, you can tell who's a child and who's not, right? You can right. you know how old people are, and that's really easy to just, okay, you you give it to you give it to children or assign it mm -hmm. to, you know, whoever their guardians are or something like that. I mean right. Alaska is already doing it, right? Yeah. Um, right uh, now yeah, the social security disability and like uh, food stamps and things increase with per child. 
And so it's sort of like a child benefit in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do have these various non-universal child benefits in the United States um, targeted towards towards people who you know meet certain income requirements and that kind of thing. Yeah. And we have a general one too, which is the tax credit for kids. Uh, uh -huh. Yes, the earned income tax credit is higher. No, I mean, when you have a oh, there's kid, a child tax there's credit. a tax yeah, yeah, credit yeah. for everybody up to, a, not everybody, but it's up to a pretty high income. But it's, you don't get it if you're not, if you don't earn any money, right? No, uh, you don't. No, so that's like a separate one, I guess. Yeah. So I guess I'm just saying there's This one is the new Mitt Romney, uh, Michael Bennett one is going to oh. be a universal um, child allowance, oh, even see. if you didn't pay any taxes. Uh, yeah. I see. Yeah. Now it seems yeah. like it's divided in, at the moment into like the welfare programs you're talking about and then right. the, the tax credit if you do make money or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Nick. I think something that's relevant to this that we haven't really brought in is um, like that this doesn't take into account of, and my thing about wanting basic income for my 13 year old so we can afford climbing coaching <laughs> is that um, I mean I think part of the hope is that basic income is going to I mean we talk about this effect that mm -hmm. some jobs will be able to you'll be able to get them done by paying people less mm -hmm. because they have more time yeah and it's kind of fun mm -hmm. so maybe the cost the cost of uh, having somebody teach your kid climbing will go down yeah because like that's kind of fun right People won't need to get paid as much for that. Mm -hmm. Maybe that applies to things like childcare. Yeah, could, um, could apply to that. Like yeah. if you live in a neighborhood where uh, childcare is scarce mm -hmm. because people are working long hours to make. Yeah. Like everyone's working long hours to yeah. make ends meet. Then having you know more of your support network or neighbors yeah. are hopefully going to be able to change their lifestyle and be more right. available to help. Yeah, definitely. Help and, and and some of it will probably get picked up voluntarily by parents spending a little more time with their kids or some parents choosing not to work. The parents and all of that. can work less. Yeah, but exactly. Also like the aunties and mm -hmm. grandmothers. Everybody, and yeah. Uncles. And, mm -hmm. yep. and it's interesting that you bring that up because like in this example in France, they didn't fix the fact that a lot of the poor mothers had no time to spend with their kids. Like they did fortunately like give the kids a place to go, but they didn't like really allow the parents to actually be with their kids because uh -huh. they didn't give any money directly to the parents, right? They created like this daycare system where the kids could go. Um, so if that's typically the way we've tried to solve this problem instead of giving parents more options or choices, um, which I agree could also have secondary effects on the cost of childcare too. Um, yeah. yeah. And even now, like the, in the political debates, it's exactly the same thing where people talk about needing subsidized childcare or like that kind of thing as opposed to the op more more like options that would make it naturally cheaper or would allow parents to stay with their kids. The reason they argued for that is because they 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 t I think they talked about it in the last debate they were talking about um, how they're like they're specialists and things that can take care of the children better than the parents mm -hmm. personally. Yeah, I mean, there, I think there are some arguments for it too. Like, I'm not, I don't know if I'm taking like a strong position on subsidized childcare, but. But it is interesting that that's usually the only option that people talk about, as opposed to obviously like right. something like basic income or you know, um, like the Mars story or whatever. And I think it's it's also true that um, you know there's a benefit to giving parents the freedom to spend time with their children, even if they are not you know trained professional uh, you know caregivers yeah. or something like that. It's still um, you know, socially pretty efficient, yeah. um, you know, if, if parents want to be with their children and raise their children, yeah. you know, that can be a good thing. Um, and, you know, you, you hear, you know, we're, when we're talking about the debate, you, they do talk about, you know, like paid family leave and stuff That's like that. They so that. these are that. these are measures that they want to put in place to give parents more time to spend with their children, That's especially when they're, when they're first. Yeah, when they're little. I mean, it's only when they're first born, but, um, but it's also interesting because it's, the the policy of of paid family leave uh exists under the assumption that what the parents are normally doing is working right they're normally not with their children so we're creating a special thing that let them be with their children at the beginning yeah. for a few months yeah or something That's like that uh yeah so so just the fact that that it's even coming from that mindset shows uh right. what our culture is like around yeah, around work yeah yeah okay. but yeah i mean this isn't really our topic for today but you know there are benefits also to like like the, the child cares in France are really excellent with like very highly trained people and they socialize the kids to be very French. And so I'm not saying there aren't some benefits to that style too, but 
it's a choice you're making in terms of where you put the money as a government in terms of sort of pushing people towards one kind of childcare strategy or another. And so it's worth right. thinking about both options and kind of where you want to push things. Um, do you want to push parents to work themselves and have their kids raised by professionals more or, right. or not? Yeah. Or do you want to give them more freedom to choose? Or do you want to give them yeah. more freedom to choose? Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Any more thoughts before the next quote? Um... All right, here we go. Just going to be the next, uh, <laughs> next paragraph here. Uh, child allowances aren't the same as basic income programs. But some of these schemes, which exist in a number of countries, can be thought of as a kind of UBI for kids. An increase in child benefit rates has translated to a drop in poverty rates in Canada. It seems clear that allocating a certain baseline amount to children helps avoid the most crushing forms of child poverty. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. that's kind of like the same logic, basic logic we always use, which is, yeah, of course, if you give people money, they're less poor. So if yeah. you give children money, those children will be less poor. Or the families. The families with the children will yeah, be less exactly. poor. Um, and those families will, I mean, this is all, of course, pretty straightforward, but, you know, you, you'd see, if you're doing this at the level of a whole economy, you're going to see some of the macroeconomic effects that you would see from a basic income. Yeah, true. Uh, like, those families are spending more into the economy mm -hmm. and, you know, allowing allowing people to profit more from businesses. You know, there's, there's more money flowing in the economy. Yeah. And some of it won't even be spent on child stuff, you know. Right, yeah. Um, and I think this is, we'd probably see similar effects with things like social security. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the fact that uh, retired people have all this money to spend, you know, means that there's more flow, more money flowing in the mm -hmm. economy. So when I think about kind of the macroeconomic effects of basic income and how it increases the level of consumer spending in the economy, I think you can really look to programs like this or programs like social security um, to get an idea of the kinds of effects that we would see. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have any more thoughts on this one. Uh, Brian says, as a matter of social policy, what about starting a child's dividend three months before they're due? Make sure new mothers have the extra resources to spend uh, when the nesting instinct kicks in. Well, there uh, actually is a, a um, yeah. an experiment with that. Yeah. It starts before they're born, they're before they're born, and then it goes through for the until they're like two years old or something. Hmm. Okay. Where is that? Um, it's it's spread out in a number of hospitals. There's a, a number of hospitals that they choose random children there, and they give them the, uh, the resources uh, in various parts of the country so that they can test how the money is spent there. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, so certainly, you know, like, we do want to provide resources to mothers so they can have healthy babies. Like, this is something that... Um, or to, to families, um, you know, we do want to support people in having healthy families and healthy children and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I think, yeah. I think th that we're not talking about basic income anymore, though. Yeah. Uh, and I think ahead. that this woman, understandably, what was her name again? In the, so lucky. So lucky. It was a female woman, right? Anyway, yeah. That, that she understandably is more concerned about, you know, child poverty in the U.S. than she is about, um, global stabilization of population. She's also not thinking of a global basic income anyway, so it doesn't even affect population in other countries. Um, so so there's just not that aspect of, of, of the trade-off in her mind, I don't think at all, when she's talking about this. Right. Um, so, so then it doesn't seem like there's much of a downside. Oh, um, the experiment is like, in, I think it's in Minneapolis, there's one in Providence, there's a, a, another hospital in, um, like Texas, and it's in various places. So it's spread around, around the United States, basically. Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. But I also think, like, again, she's assuming a certain amount of basic income that's maybe more limited than what we might think is possible. So she's probably also more concerned about poverty than, than if you had a higher basic income. Right. So she might be thinking about, like, Yang's $1,000 a I'm, month or I'm something like that. I'm just thinking she is, yeah. probably. Well, she's directly talking about his plan, so that's fair yes. enough that she would yeah. be thinking about that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a problem, though, that if you start talking about being nice to children, you have to defend why are you only being nice to mm -hmm. children in rich countries. Right, like the American UBI versus other. Yeah, yeah. and I think that's, um, that's true not just for children, but it's also true. Like, would you say that it's any different than saying, like, we're taking care of American citizens, why aren't we, you know, taking care of 
uh, people in South America or, or well, know. if you uh, if you were just if you had this whole conversation be um, basic income as Federal Reserve monetary policy, yeah, then you don't think I'm talking about the you know United States Federal Reserve, right? I um, see. It gets to avoid all of that. I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Richard. Um, yeah, and I, I've said in a recent interview that you could uh, that. Was it we spend less than one percent of our GDP on what is it foreign aid, and it we can if we use foreign aid, if we increase the amount of foreign aid, then we reduce the issues with like um caravans from Nicaragua and things like that, mm -hmm. and so from um like reducing foreign aid actually caused the the whole caravan issue that he's. Uh, argument on and on about another way to solve the problem is to say is to be just decide that we're happy about people coming to our country yeah true mm -hmm. yeah uh, but you could make the same kind of argument for international conflict and stuff like that too yes right? for um, sure yeah that it's preventative a lot of the time people are not going to want to fight yeah. us in wars as much if we're sending them a lot of money yeah and I think it's even more targeted than that like I suspect I don't know how thoughtful our foreign aid is but you know if it reduces Poverty, it might reduce the growth of terrorism. Like, there's probably oh, yeah. targeted aspects to how we're doing it, or there could be. Yep. Uh, like, um, there, uh, like in Charlie Wilson's war in Afghanistan, we dropped the ball after we defeated the, the Soviets. Hmm. And so, if we had invested in schools and things like that, we wouldn't have had to deal with the madrasas uh, educating children to become terrorists. Interesting. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And we left a lot of weapons there, too. Um, yep. <laughs> Uh, so, Good times. Good times. yeah. Any 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 further thoughts on this one before we move on? Okay. I feel like I kind of got her point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's even an argument, for instance, regarding Finland and Scotland that UBI favoring adults actually worsens relative child poverty, which is often calculated as a proportion of the medium income by increasing the gap in incomes. Russell Gunson, the head of the think tank IPPR Scotland, has, along with colleagues, analyzed the potential effects of the basic income guarantee proposed by the Scottish Green Party and another Scottish think tank, Reform Scotland. The proposed amounts are £100 per working age adult per week and £50 per child. According to Gunson, the direct slash immediate effects of a UBI introduced in Scotland alone would increase relative child poverty against the Scotland poverty line. So, uh, I mean, I think obviously this is... <laughs> I, don't get it. I don't get it at all. I get it, so, but I think it's uh, silly. I, right, so I'm with Bethany. Uh, so so the, the idea is that if you are giving all this new money to adults... Uh, then the adults that ha that have children uh, are getting less money per person. So you're making children or or families with children relatively poorer. It's than actually the ones my point children. that I framed as a positive, which right. is that it's still it's more expensive to have kids if they're not getting like the same level of basic right. income that every adult is. Yes, which I see as a positive because it curtails the population. But she's saying you could think of that as kids are in families. Like if you have a family with 10 kids or any kids, they're in a family that has less money on average than a family without kids. Right. And she's calling that like a child, like the children themselves are poorer than the relative, and, than the average of the, of the population. And to be clear, the children are less poor. Everyone's less than poor they were in this That's scenario. That's why it's a little bit silly. They're just yeah. not as much less poor as the families without children. Yeah, exactly. I actually read, it, uh, read about how... Um, Bill Gates only has three children when he can afford, uh, afford hundreds of children. Yeah, that's that's true. Why did he make that decision? That's weird. Yeah. But some of these things are <laughs> some of these things are cultural. Like, um, if it, it, like there's a cultural norm that develops. So if the whole culture became more economically beneficial to have more kids, you might see that whole cultural norm shift right. too. So yeah. even looking at just specific wealthy individuals doesn't always tell the whole story of what would happen. But it is right. a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, does this make sense now, Nick? Or I don't know if I explained it very well. So, so there's the distinction between relative poverty and absolute poverty. Exactly, yeah. It's like the so, in a, inequality versus absolute thing so that we talk about. So families that. are getting more money, uh, and their children are better off, and the families are better off. What she's calling attention to is the fact that 
the families without children are getting more benefit per person than the families with children. Yeah. Are. So if if um, if there's a couple, like if if you know me and Alex have no kids, we each get a hundred pounds. We have two hundred pounds. We have one hundred pounds per person. If you and like your wife, let's say you just had one kid, you'd get two hundred and fifty pounds total. But if you divided that by three, you each have less per person than we do. Right. Does that make sense? You'd have I have but, ha, but let's say none of us have jobs. Right. Mm -hmm. We we start out with zero. Yeah. Yes. Well, I guess so. I see. So, so we were all we, equal before. <laughs> now we're not. Yeah. So you're still way better off than you were before. You're just like a little farther apart from the right. from the childless families. It seems dumb. I seems that's why I thought it was. I think dumb everyone too. agrees that this is kind of dumb. <laughs> uh, but there is this kind of tendency in our culture to yeah. really call attention to relative poverty. How poor are people compared to how rich other people other are? That people kind are. Of thing. Yeah, there really is that um, tendency. That's true. It's yeah. It's. it's a I would big also thing, point yeah. out though, there's a way in which this is like not true, not not unimportant in the sense that it's my whole point from before, which is that right. do we want to make it a little bit more expensive to have kids than not to have kids, or to have more kids than than fewer kids? Or like, do we just want to want to? Um, continue that like having a kid it costs something we don't want to per necessarily perfectly well, yeah, compensate cur everyone currently it yeah. is that way do yeah. we want to continue that um, right. or do we want to not continue that and so this this is sort of relevant to that but that's not how she's thinking about it right in fact does she ever talk about the con of population that i talked about um it that gets she has a con that's not uh, it gets mentioned a little bit later okay. yeah um uh, she kind of writes it off yeah but again yeah. if she's just looking at the u.s i think it's easier to write it off Right, because it's just well, one country, and it's. I don't. I don't know that she's just looking at the U.S., um, but know. certainly, I think what she's seeing. We'll we'll get to this in a little bit, but what she's seeing is the you know you're eliminating poverty, which reduces the birth rate. Mm. So she's taking that to mean that there is no incentive effect of oh, of giving money to okay. like she's like that's a myth or something like that. No, that's it's not true. She, it's yeah. not a myth. No, it's just that there's two two competing effects. Yeah. Yeah, like you've been uh, talking about. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. I, right. see, I, see, I see. Yeah. You ready? Why for isn't this? she here so we can really talk to her? Uh, <laughs> would you want her to be here? I don't know. Sometimes I feel like it would be more like fair for the people writing these things who are also probably pretty thoughtful people to be able to like weigh in and defend themselves. I think themselves. I yeah. think that might be true. I also might feel more like I was being actively mean. Like we would have to curtail what we here. said. We'd have to be yeah. more polite. That's yeah. true. We probably should be polite anyway. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, all right, you ready for the next one? Okay. So it seems obvious that expanding the pool of beneficiaries to include children, especially in countries with young populations, would increase the already high cost of a UBI. Zalecki believes that the amount proposed by Yang could be cut in half, but extended to children to significantly reduce not just economic precarity, but also economic inequality. I think you could get some pretty significant effects with a smaller basic income, with a $500 a month basic income, but that goes to adults and children. Does that mean that children also get $500 a month? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. Well, you're majorly, again, like paying families to have kids. Um, you, you are um also children do they cost the exact same as adults in terms of because otherwise you're really paying for people to have kids yeah because the, the kids aren't going to use up as much money as an adult would potentially not yeah. but if so i guess it depends on where you're looking at the at the poverty situation right yeah. like is this 500 dollars um for a kid going to be enough to you know, feed them and clothe them and, and raise them and everything. Uh, Whereas yeah, yeah. maybe if it was, um, you know, if, good point. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. if it was, if it was only going to adults, well, actually this doesn't really make any sense. Cause you have a, if you have a single, if you have a single parent and that parent is getting $500 and the child is getting $500, that's exactly equivalent to yeah, just the parent getting $1,000. Yeah, but if you have three kids as a single parent, it's not... Three kids as a single parent. That's what I didn't think of. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it is incentive. I mean, for better or for worse, it's incentivizing that, kind of. Uh, yes. I mean, if, I mean, not maybe not, because $500 isn't that much, like you said. And, and it, yeah, it could still be the case where the um, eliminating poverty effect is outweighing the incentive effect of, of, of yeah. paying money. Yeah. Um, and I think that's probably true. Uh, well, it, yeah. I don't quite see how having more children 
Well, let's see. If everybody gets a million dollars per child, right. then it, it's where to, to it's. Yeah, so it depends on how big it is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm, I'm always imagining UBIs as kind of small, hmm. um, even if it's the UBI is as high as it can go before it's, uh, you know, before the uh, supply sector can no longer make enough stuff. Yeah, yeah. It would still be kind of low. So I don't think that, I mean, having another poor kid just doesn't seem like having more poor kids is ever going to make anybody rich. Hmm. I guess maybe I have the intuition that it could, like if more automation happened or whatever, that it could actually be quite high or like quite a big percentage of people's income, in which case that might be different. So we're talking about a couple of different things, I think. Mm. Um, so Steve, you're talking about if the basic income is small, then it might solve the poverty problem or uh, alleviate the poverty problem for the, the family, but it's not going to be you know, enough money that, you know, like, oh, I just want to have more children, mm -hmm. but they might be able to be more responsible about having children because now they have the resources to kind of manage and stuff like that. Well, I think it's important to, to not make having more and more children become profitable for the parents. Right. A money-making yeah. venture for the parents. Yeah. But I, uh, I'm imagining that, that will, that that will not happen anyway among poor people mm. because they'll be living off the UBI of the parents and the kids, which will never be, which will really only keep them up to the, the poverty line, and it'll never, nobody will ever be making a profit yeah. uh, off of any surplus for the kids, particularly since kids are turning out to be so expensive. It was $13,000 a year, um, plus if you add in uh, public school and other stuff, like public school. Well, the government's already paying. Yeah. 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 Um, so the kids are already expensive. Yeah. Um, so I don't think that it'll ever be, that, that people will ever be incentivized to have children. But I guess we can look at um, France and Japan mm -hmm. and, well, in particular France, they actually try, they're trying to yeah, raise their population. Yeah. So there's yeah. actual yeah. numbers I could find somewhere. Right. So um, to, to Bethany's point um, that you were just making, um, if you imagine an economy in which nobody's working, like the extreme case of of just um, you know an efficient labor market, not not very much money is going to people through that labor market, then it has to be the case that the amount total amount of basic income paid out to people has to be at least as much as the stuff that's being bought by all consumers in the economy. Mm -hmm. So that's not exactly GDP because we also import and export stuff. But you would imagine it to be on the order of the of the country's GDP, uh, so that's going to be something like five thousand to six thousand dollars a month per person. So that's kind of like the the upper limit of of the, the the basic income probably wouldn't go any higher than that unless people are just sitting accumulating money and not spending very much of it or something like that. Um, so so that's kind of like the upper limit, but. I imagine that it's probably a lot higher than a thousand dollars a month, even in today's economy. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess one thing I'm thinking is like, currently at least, and this could change, the global population is stabilized; it's not going down. And so, any incentive to have more kids could potentially, if it's meaningful at all, could potentially destabilize it. So currently, it's stabilizing with a huge disincentive to have kids economically. Like it's still pretty expensive. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when you say stabilizing, it isn't that we've managed to achieve this perfect, you know, plateau, plateau where the population is staying exact. And Bizarrely, then you tip it. no, well, go ahead, yeah. It's it's not that we're achieving this perfect plateau where the population is staying exactly the same, and then if you tip it, tip the incentives a little bit, we go back into exponential growth. I think it's 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 shown that it's that it's going to start coming back down again. Oh, I hadn't heard it was going to come down. Well, I mean, they haven't extrapolated that far into the future. And, and like minor hard. things could change, like where it levels off and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of this. But I, I think you're right that that, you know, a little bit of change in incentive can go from can cause us to shift from, you know, population decreasing to you know, population exponentially e increasing, like that's a very, you know, delicate yeah. thing. And I guess I'm also saying that yeah. like, certainly we don't want it to maybe be ex like profitable to have kids, but making it less costly could also affect people's decisions because there's other reasons that they want to have the kids, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah Nick. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I sort of, my intuition is that 
if we wound up, you know, in a very rosy future, mm -hmm. this kind of fully automated luxury yeah. communism or whatever it is, um, and that that the thing that would limit the number of kids people wanted to have wouldn't come down to kind of financial mm. incentives. Like it would be dominated by, like on the one hand, the, the fulfillment that comes from being a parent. Right. Um, uh, yeah, and, and on the other hand, like what a pain in the neck it is. Yeah, all the time and everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. That's a good point. Yeah, it's hard to know. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. There are a lot of incentives that aren't monetary. Yeah. yeah. And if we, I think it might be interesting to try to think through mm -hmm. if we could assume yeah. maybe someday we're in that regime where we are not worried about mm -hmm. the negative consequences of like an incentive for that yeah. would lead to a problematic amount of population growth. Yeah, yeah. Then what? Then how would we want to? Start? Yeah, if you take that concern off the table, yeah, what would if, you want? If to other do? factors, yeah, allay that mm -hmm. fear. I mean, maybe it's immigration to Mars, or yeah, yeah. Uh, we need that people go to Mars. Then. Yeah. <laughs> well, then I guess it comes down to some of Alex's questions, where if you think of basic income the way he would do it, if you're giving it specifically to kids, you're giving less to every adult on average, and how do you want to play with that trade-off? Would be part of how you think about it, right? If you took my concern off the table. Uh, right now, yeah. there are already both people receive like the earned income tax credit or, or challenge to benefit or whatever. Uh, both of them go to uh, are increased for uh, people to have parents, uh, children, and so that in the um, individual they don't receive that as much for it mm -hmm. and so it's like biased against them right and i think it comes down to your question before nick about like at that point it's more like who's the appropriate person to allocate the child's money is one of the things right like the child themselves or the parent or i guess i don't know if that's really part of it actually but well i, I mean i i think there's there there's two dimensions we can think about it here yeah. there's um should should we consider the child benefit part of basic income uh, and then there's the question of the trade-off of how, how many resources are you allocating to families with children? How much spending power are you allocating right. to them? And then does that come from, um, you know, families without children? Uh, and then there's the, so the third dimension is, and then what are the incentive effects of, of, of giving more money to uh, yeah. people who have children? But I guess kind he's, of he's kind of saying, like, if you're not worried about people having more kids, then wouldn't you just maybe want, like, People to be kind of equivalently better off. So would you? So would you get well off? So would you give like a, a crowd credit that kind of relates to the average level of expense or something like that? You, you might, yeah. You know that kind I of. I think thing. it comes yeah. down to. I mean, it comes down to maybe as a society. Yeah. How like, what fraction of resources do we want to devote to mm -hmm. the things that kids and families of kids right, want? Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, if people um, can live to be 150 or something like that, that drives down the number of people wanting to have children. Because the, uh, as people, how do I say, as the people live longer, they, they don't, they can have, go through multiple careers if there is a need for that in the future with, the, with automation and things. And they could, um, are you saying that they are going to have fewer kids over the course of their entire life or fewer kids per year of their life? Over the course of their entire life? So when they're younger, they're going to have fewer kids because they know they're going to live to be 150? Mm-hmm. I guess I'm not sure I understand the connection. That's what I read before. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure I 100% um, see why that would be. Um, and if that is the case, then it's great and it takes care of itself, assuming the two, you know, things balance balance each other out, the people living longer, but then also having fewer children. Um, but if it doesn't balance out, then you can imagine um, 
maybe maybe it's natural that people want to have that uh, couples want to have two kids, but then people start living forever or closer to forever than they do now. So maybe you even want to uh, put some measures in place that create a disincentive to have kids or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Because also, if people live longer, then the um, old norms. Uh, stay around longer so that mm. as uh, if people lived only people who live a uh, population that only lived to like 50 or something like that people they, um uh their new ideas and things take place uh take hold much faster and they're able to evolve but if they live for a really long time then the old norms and whatever just uh, are, are just staying around even if they're non advantageous. Yeah, science advance, advances by one funeral at a time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was going to say too, like, it's, it also seems to happen that, um, and it would depend on advances in other technology, but like people also seem to just like extend every phase of life when they live longer, so people have kids later as well. I mean, there's a limit right now on that, but if we're thinking of this future where people are living to 150, you know, are people even having their kids at the same age? Like, it could just be that the whole thing gets expanded. That's happened a bit in history already as people have lived longer. Um, so there's different ways I could see it going. Yeah. And that would affect how many kids people want to have, too. Yeah. You'd have to listen to classic rock for 150 yeah. years. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. But I wonder, too, like like I said, if, if the phases of life get expanded, some of what affects people's malleability is like whether they're interacting with new people or have to learn a new skill or something. And so if people are doing that later, they might be more flexible. I'm not sure. Right. Um, you know, be more willing to try new things to a later age. Yeah. yeah. All right. You guys ready for the next quote? Well, hey, what's the... Yeah, so Brian yeah. says... Families are religions. Um, yeah, so let me read the, what he said. Uh, so Brian said, there are some families or religions that could turn a children's dividend into a profitable enterprise, but the exception shouldn't drive the basic rules. But like with the, uh, a former representative had 22 children because he's part of the quiverful evangelical movement, which uh, was, um, they keep having children, they don't believe in birth control or anything like that. They decide, uh, say God will decide when they stop having children. So they keep having children as many as they can, so they can expand the evangelical movement, and they hope to take over the country through having too many children or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, good luck to them. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, there can be group. They can, there yeah. can be group level incentives to have a lot of kids. Yeah. Um, like a lot of religions, there's an argument that a, that a lot of religions promote having more kids as a way, so more subtly as a way to like keep the religion strong and right. full of members and stuff like that. Like with right. the, the Jews after the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And and um, arguably, some people think that has something to do with the connection between religion and stances on things like birth control and abortion and stuff in general. Some people don't. It's a controversial point, but yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I think Brian's point basically stands, though, which is that, um, you know, there are these exceptions to what the you know normal pattern of behavior is. Yeah. And what we should be targeting if we want to worry about incentives is the normal, you know, tweaking what the what the expectation is, the average. Yeah, at think. least in terms yeah. of the main policy. And then maybe right. you have like additional safeguards for this kind of thing. Yeah, or, potentially. Or yeah. if it's a big problem. I think this relates yeah. to the, the discussion earlier about do you trust parents to like spend the money appropriately for their kids? Again, like the average is probably that you roughly do, but then there's obviously exceptions and how do you deal with that? Yeah. So my mom says that Catholics want more souls, they say, but also more tithing opportunities. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. So that's consistent a little with, bit with the story we're telling <laughs> what here. What some people say. Yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. uh, all right. Uh, you guys ready for the next quote? Yeah. Um, let me just scroll up a little bit. What's good for children is often good for women, Zalecki says. I think it's really important, not just for children, but for gender equality, for the basic income to go to children, as long as women have a disproportionate responsibility for the care of children. Mm -hmm. So I guess... Maybe this is one of those things where there are more 
direct ways to address this kind of thing. I'm trying to think like, this about feels it. Like, so to me, this feels like um, if you want uh, basic income for children, and then she's trying to think of all the benefits it might have, and this is like one of them that I'm she gets to I'm pretty sure that's how list. she was doing this, but yeah. Um, but I don't know. I guess I'm trying to think. I guess the idea is like in terms of the the money that women have at their disposal, if they're more like single mothers than single fathers, is that kind of where she's coming from? Then this would help with gender equality. Uh, yes, I think yeah, because there's more single mothers than single fathers. Because if it was even, then it wouldn't disproportionately affect the genders. right because yeah. and if you have a family with a woman and a man the money is kind of going to both of them anyway right. so i think this would have to be driven by the single mother thing i think right. that is yeah. true that there are more, there are yeah a lot more single parents totally um, yeah. families headed by mothers and men single although mother. it doesn't necessarily have to be just about the single mother thing if you have a two-parent family um you know and the mothers are the ones who bear more of the cost of having the child then giving more money in proportion to how many children you have also could benefit the mothers more than the fathers. Like because they use it on childcare or something like that? Yeah. Or not just because they use it on childcare, but because they're bearing the cost of having the child uh, or raising the child, um, the family as a whole gets more benefit if they have more children, so it affects women more. Well, I guess I'm not totally understanding. I'm trying to think about how it would, because like women bearing the cost might be like they're spending more of the time on the kids. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Um, and so if they have more money, that doesn't necessarily mean they're spending more time, less time. I mean, it does if they use it on childcare or if they use um, it on like a, the time being more pleasant because they have more money to spend on right. conveniences. Yes. I guess that that is yeah, quite plausible that's what I meant. actually. Yeah. Because a lot of, you know, it, you, with less money, it's a lot harder to care for the kid. You have fewer right. like conveniences that you can buy, and yes. you have to use cloth diapers and yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, that makes sense. So my mom says, I think that argument is good, actually. A way that Yang might frame differently, but it's about uh, a way to help women uh, out of the workplace who are actually working. Yeah. Um, that's actually uh, later on in the article, it's Yang's argument. Hmm. Yeah, so I don't like the framing of basic income as paying people for work that would ordinarily not be paid or like compensating for unpaid labor. But I do like the idea of uh, basic income giving people more freedom to spend their time mm -hmm. how they want to spend it. And that includes doing important mm -hmm. things that aren't paid in the market. <clears throat> I think that's uh, right. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a better framing. Yeah. Uh, you guys ready for the next one? Well, isn't this or, yeah, paragraph as stupid as the previous paragraph? Isn't it equally saying, well, giving UBI to children is unfair to men because even though men will get more money, they'll get relatively less more money right. than yeah. women who are mothers with uh, more than two children at home. Yeah, right. but, but she's saying that that's good because yeah. it's helping win women catch up from an unfair. Right. Yeah. So I I'm that's starting that's saying, idea, yeah. I'm saying that it's bad. Someone because could uh, this whole article is stupid. I think, I think. Who is the lucky by the way? She. She's. Uh, what did it say? Sorry, I didn't mean to. NYU Singapore. That. NYU Shanghai. Yeah. She is a political science professor. Alma Zalecki. Okay. Yeah. Where were we? Uh, this one, yeah. Um, so I think, Steve, you're right that you can look at it kind of with the same logic um, here, whereas before she was using this logic to say that it was um, making uh, families with children or making children even more relatively poor. Mm -hmm. um, here it's, um, she's saying that it's making women or it's making men more relatively worse off but it's it's going in the direction she wants, which is the point that Nick was making. That it's yeah. it's it's bringing up women relative to men, so bringing men down, I guess. Yeah. Um, but is it, yeah, it is. A, you can. It's a similar kind of logic. Well, yeah, especially uh, yeah. if she's thinking if you're cutting Yang's program like amount in half. Right. To do this, then that's definitely right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
But it only helps women with children, for what it's worth. In terms of gender equality. It only helps women with children, yeah. But I wonder, I mean, maybe those are the women that show the biggest price, like pay difference in other, and wealth difference anyway, so I'm not sure. Actually, I mean, she's she's targeting something that's more likely to happen to women, which is that which yeah, is yeah, the taking care of children. Yeah. Uh, uh, I've uh, actually heard that um, women are be benefiting in our education system in the past like couple of decades because... Um, Let's see. Uh, because women, uh, since they're trying to even equalize the balance, that um, more women are becoming educated and men are becoming, well, well, less educated. And so women are having a difficult time finding um, husbands and things that are of a suitable education level and whatnot. So men are having an easier time. Finding men educated wives. Uh, no, they're not, because those wives don't want to marry them. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah cool. Unless unless they're you. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. That's that's an interesting point. But that comes out of an interesting artifact then too, which is like, or like interesting feature, which is the gender asymmetry in whether people care about having someone of the same income. Right. Like there's there's an expectation from both men and women that the that the man be of equal or higher status. Equal or, or higher, like right. That. Exactly, yeah. yeah, which yeah. is interesting. But I think that might be changing over time too with women getting more It's gonna have to. Yeah, well, people want to marry someone. Is it gonna have to? Yeah, we could just stay unmarried, but I doubt this is I'm just saying like I'm just saying that like Jeff that. Bezos could have a thousand wives or something like that. Oh that's true. And that would solve the problem. That would solve it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know if that that has its own issues. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> All right, you ready for the next <laughs> laws one? Laws would have to get changed. Yeah, laws yeah, would have yeah. to get changed, but and also... Think yeah. of how many nude selfies you'd have to send. Right? Yeah, he'd have um, too many. Amazon would go tank. He'd, he'd have to use Amazon Web Services. To, <laughs> to, to, you know, like, he could scale up on the cloud. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. oh my gosh. Um, but also, like, we've talked about how, like, there can be more... There's arguments that there can be more violence and problems yeah. if most men don't have any mates and the best men have all the mates. Because yes. there's a huge incentive to take risks to become that person, um, which is often not considered good for like a stable society. Some uh, people argue this is why monogamy norms evolved and uh, spread. Like uh, actually, that's it. Like, like George Peterson? Jordan, Jordan Peterson. Peters. Yeah. Oh, who's Jordan Peterson? Uh, I'll tell you later. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's actually an issue so in China. China. <laughs> with the, with the, Maybe I should keep it that way. That's actually an issue in China uh, and with the one child policy. They didn't have. They had an incentive to abort uh, female babies, mm, oh, and yeah. so they're kidnapping um, women in like Vietnam and Cambodia and things to bring them up to. Oh, for China. marriage because they didn't mm -hmm. have equal numbers. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. 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 Yeah, yeah. In the, in the FLDS, sorry, one, one more example. In in like the the polygamous Mormon offshoots. Um, they sometimes kick the male members out, mm -hmm. a lot of them, with no education or preparation for the world because they don't really educate people the same way there uh, because they don't they have polygamy, so there are a lot of people without wives. So it really does create, it can create some issues. So I don't know, a thousand to Jeff Bezos, I feel like that could really create some issues. Uh. <laughs> So maybe your plan of shifting norms of, you know, maybe that's a better plan. Of... Like where people can just marry women with more education than yeah, them. I feel like yeah. that's a better solution. All right, let's go with that one. Than your plan <laughs> yeah. of everybody marrying Jeff Bezos. All right. Uh, I, don't know. I think the I think the new self is problem can be solved. That problem yeah. can be solved. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm I'm not worried about him. Technology. I'm not yeah. so worried about Jeff. It's more the rest of the men and, and the kind of trouble they're going to get up to. You know, oh, no. but, yeah. I'm worried Jeff is going to get assassinated by the rest of the men. <laughs> All right, you ready? For the uh, next quote? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, though it's a misconception that receiving public assistance makes people more likely to have large families, in some countries with dramatically declining birth rates, governments are stepping up child-related benefits in the hopes of curbing the decline. Abhijit Banerjee, an economist at MIT, comments, if you are talking about the rich countries where lack of population growth is the problem, there is no reason not to pay households extra for children. Maybe in some countries, people will worry about the incentives to, to have more children, but certainly not in the richer countries. So this blog post was written before Abhijit Banerjee won the Nobel Prize a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, they would have said Nobel Prize winning. winning yeah. Prize. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, sure. I guess I have to, we've talked about this a lot, but yeah. I guess one comment on it is like, 
what we really care about is the global. And right now, the, the rich countries having a lower birth rate, or one thing you can care about is the global, it might be counteracting right. some of the other countries. Um, but in, in addition to that, um, they seem to be confusing what you were saying before, which is that there are two effects operating. So depending on the amount, receiving public assistance or whatever, you know, paying people think something when they have kids might not increase family size. But if the amount got high enough, like a million dollars, obviously it would. So right. I think they're not thinking about it, that it could go that high, I guess, probably in this article. So they're not really thinking about that. So the, the misconception is maybe that the monetary incentive to have more children uh, dominates the effect of having less children from other property. Or maybe people even aren't even thinking of this other effect. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And, and or it could be that like, at a certain income level, Nick is right, and like it's not really the economics that dominate the decision anymore. Right. Like I could, you know, there could be that it's more about the time invested and the effort and the opportunity cost. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm open to that possibility. Even if you gave Bill Gates a million dollars for every additional child he had, he'd still probably stick yeah. to three children. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm just always a bit nervous because it's like this bi this biological miracle that we are not in the Malthusian trap, which is what you'd expect every organism to be in. That we don't have kids to the point of like we can't support them anymore. It's very interesting that humans are not like that, and it's extraordinarily beneficial that humans are not like that. Um, and so that's always like making me a little edgy. But I, I could be that, and I don't need to be that edgy about that. Right. <laughs> I yeah. never thought about it that way, but yeah. yeah, it's like this massive blessing to the way that things work. That is very different from other animals. Yeah, or a lot of other animals. So, like, Malthus turned out to be wrong, but he had a good reason to think he was right. Which is, right. he would argue that people would just always have kids to the point of poverty. And the, yeah. and the data for being able to say that is yeah. only from the last few decades. Yeah, he didn't have that data. You, um, yeah, exactly. Do you think it's just the ability to plan that we have? Like, ability to look forward and know how many, you know, we know our two children are going to survive, so we're going to have two children. No, and... it's like a, it's like a, a defect <laughs> from a genetic perspective. It's the fact that there's indirect layers in between what the genes really would want to pass on more and what we actually decide. Like, our genes would proliferate more if we had kids up to the point that we so could So you're not following what I'm saying? No, or, I am following. Oh, go ahead. I, let me connect it to what you're saying. Yeah, okay. So what you're saying is like, oh, we can plan and we can be like, oh, we'll have a few kids survive. That's great. We'll be happy. But like, really, why not think if you're Jeff Bezos, like, if you were just driven by your genes, you would say, I can afford to have like a thousand kids right. survive. So, like, I'm going right. to do that. So, so the point yeah. I'm trying to make is that if you're an animal, you want a certain number of children uh, and you've got instincts that tell you that having as many offspring as possible is going to get you the optimal number of children. That's just what your instincts tell you. So you just, you know, like if you took that animal out of the environment of, you know, evolutionary adaptation, right. then they would just, you know, grow exponentially until, yeah. until but poverty. But I'm claiming right. that people are not having the optimal number of children from a genetic perspective. I'm... They're so not optimizing their number of grandkids. In term, the genes are, I'm saying the genes are influencing the instinct, which uh, we might have an instinct that we want to have a lot of children, like we want to keep having sex, you know, that kind of thing. But we, but our planning has, has hacked over that, right? So, so the, the genes don't, aren't, aren't going to teach us to plan to have a certain number of children. They're just going to teach us the immediate right. incentives, right? But it could right? be that our conscious desire was also to have the maximum number of children, like the way it is in this religious group where they have that belief. But fortunately, it's not. And that's like the interesting component. I, I think it is interesting, but it's not like a puzzle or a mystery. It doesn't feel mysterious to me that that's how it worked out, right? It's somewhat mysterious. Okay. It's not, I'm not saying it's mysterious, <laughs> but it, it wouldn't have had to work out that way. Like it's, um, it, or maybe it would, but it's not there's, obvious. There's no, reason, there's no reason why it would have worked out any other way because there's no, there's no reason why the animals would want to have the maximum children in the, in the long term if all their genes needed is the instincts to procreate as much as possible. Yeah, but for example, humans also learn yeah. from other people yeah. and they tend to learn from successful people. Sure. And for some reason that's highly biased towards people with high status, not so highly biased, at least it seems, towards people with the most kids. You could have imagined that learning mechanism would lead us to always copy the things that people with the most kids are doing. That would not be a stupid learning mechanism to evolve, but we didn't evolve that learning mechanism. We copy prestige, like social, social prestige, but we don't copy number of kids directly. That doesn't seem to be the way the learning works, which is fortunate for this issue, but is not necessarily how you might have imagined the system would be designed. 
I can understand <laughs> why Robert Malthus made the mistake that he did. <laughs> this is very far afield from the yeah, sorry, go ahead. Point. So we can debate this later. <laughs> sorry. By that woman who started Planned Parenthood, she also funded the um, the birth control pill so that it allowed the per- the planned um, families that Alex is talking about. Mm-hmm. What, what did you want Margaret to say? Something? Margaret Sanger. Sanger, yeah. yeah. Sorry, Nick, uh, you... Right. It, and I think that I think it would make a difference to this argument to know whether people were lowering their birth rates out of concern mm. about global overpopulation. Right. 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 But I think that evidence is. I mean, I don't think no, that's, that's what generally why. drives that's it. Yeah, why. it's not what drives it. Yeah, at, at all. It's other things like like wanting to pursue a career or wanting to have the kids that they do have have more a better quality of life. Yeah. And I think um, looked at yeah. that way, mm-hmm. it is true that it's like it, our big brains are actually a kind of evolutionary Yeah. They're end. not they're or not they're, they're like optimizing. they're not yeah. <laughs> improving our fitness. Yeah, they're exactly. actually doing the opposite. Exactly. That's that's what I'm which saying. Is surpri- yeah. Which, which is, is interesting. Surprising. Yeah. I mean which is or it's surprising if you're really biased towards thinking that like adaptation would be dominates. perfectly, yeah. It would be perfectly calibrated, in yeah. Evolution, um, but there are lots of like non-adaptive. Yeah, there are, and selected. and you know, for most of human history, as as uh, Richard's pointing out, we didn't necessarily have reliable birth control. So maybe all you really needed to give people was enough desire to have sex instead of a direct desire to have kids. And now, you know, so there's reasons why we maybe didn't evolve the optimal conscious desire to have the maximum number of kids. Because we didn't um, need to. Because we maybe didn't need to. Okay, but yeah. isn't there, aren't there? Uh, aren't there other examples of animals kind of regulating the number of offspring based on resource availability and like not oh and, and I kind of mars marsupials they um the pouches allow them to have to um well kill off their children instead of with um oh, what is it? Um, it changes. Placentals. They, the placentals are forced to have their children to turn. Well, mm-hmm. and, and they have, and they can now commit advanticide, but that's in, really costly. But yeah. with marsupials, they could. There's this little thing that mm-hmm. yank it out of the pouch. Yeah, they could just yeah. yeah. Kill it. <laughs> they they definitely like um, regulate like when to have kids, and there is some what they call like quality quantity trade-off that makes sense in terms of like the number of grandchildren you'll leave because if you have a bunch of kids and they all starve they're not going to leave you any grandkids but i'm arguing that humans are not up at, at that limit you know like it seems like we're having fewer kids than that would dictate right right um we're not up against immediate resource constraints like we could have more grandkids and great grandkids right. than we're having is kind of what i'm what right. i'm arguing but in nature yeah there are some like trade-offs for, for sure that that are made to actually be so that your your kids make it to have their own kids um, and don't just have so few resources that they all die or something like that. Yeah. Right. But we're so far from that, like especially in, in wealthier countries. You know, like and you see that because certain religious groups can actually have a lot more kids and they survive to have kids. You know, so they're they're more naturally get closer to that limit. And most of us aren't doing that anyway. Right. Yeah. Uh, so there's a little bit of sorry live stream that was a bit of an aside. <laughs> no, they're 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 into it. Okay. Uh, so we got a few comments on the live yeah. stream. Uh, some stuff about neo neo Malthusian dynamics. Um, mm. You know, people acclimating to a level of prosperity. Mm-hmm. That's what Eddie's talking about. Uh, Brian has given us some fun facts about Margaret Sanger. So if you're watching this video later, yeah. uh, you can check out the the live chat to read about how she had a. Affair H. G. with H.G. Wells. Wells I want to look into this. Caused Maybe caused Gandhi to have a mild stroke because she worked him up about birth control. Yeah. <laughs> she did? Oh, I, I oh wow. That's, that's what Brian says. Fascinating. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Margaret Sanger. Uh, so let's go to the last quote here. Uh, Basic income guru Scott Santens, who, like the Scottish Greens, has proposed a partial basic income for children, sees this as a kind of compromise measure. He believes that the political acceptability of UBI for children depends on whether we see a child as a choice or a human being. Mm. If it's the former, people may want to attempt to disincentivize childbearing. If it's the latter, well, good luck 
admitting to being opposed to reducing the poverty of children. Mm. Okay. Um, okay. So on that note, uh, let's oh. get people's final thoughts. Yeah, I thought this was a really interesting, interesting discussion. I really appreciated two things that you brought up, Nick. One is this question of like, how, when you're wealthy enough, like how much of the childbearing decision ends up coming down to money? And the other is this question of like, when are, how should it be phased in that, that like children when they're a bit older are making their own decisions in the market versus like their parents are kind of making those decisions for them or at least deciding whether to give them the money to make the decision. Um, that's, I think, an interesting question as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think it's also interesting to see how other people think about UBI. Yet again, it's often different than, than how we talk about it. So, yeah. yeah. Steve? Um, well, I haven't heard anything that uh, disagrees with the idea that we can just add kids as consumers and they receive the uh, same UBI as all other consumers. And when they're first born and they're very young, they need somebody else to do um, their consuming for them. So they need somebody else to help them run their lives. But a lot of adults um, will need help running their lives, um, <laughs> particularly with all, you know, uh, homeless and in deep poverty in particular, will uh, actually, I'd say it's a more interesting question how we're uh, going to get those people back in the system when mm -hmm. they when they don't even have a, uh, an address. Mm -hmm. um, so I disagree with everything in the uh, article, and uh, I disagree with uh, any comment that anybody made that was positive about anything in the article. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so that, that's how I keep it simple. <laughs> All right. Nick. Uh, I'm kind of... Uh, kind of with Steve on this and I'm kind of imagining like I mean uh, we might have to change some things like we might have to it might make sense to uh, this all this might provoke us to rethink some of how we think about children and their rights and their property rights mm -hmm. and you know maybe the norm would evolve to like even a five-year-old is getting a basic income and has a debit card and it's really not okay to like tell them how to spend it mm -hmm. within different limits than we have now i mean it might be hard for us to imagine you know yeah. where it's going interesting cool Richard. well I just really don't care for the child benefit. I think it's like what Bethany said that it could, ins if you have a uh, stable basic income of thousand dollars or or a calibrated one like Alex did, and if you if you uh, have it the same as everyone else, then you have a uh, incentive to keep the number of children within bounds so that you don't have this is uh, this um, disadvantage the children uh, past a certain level and uh, and then if you give uh, a basic income to all the same basic income to children and to parents, then you can create like a sort of baby factory <laughs> concept where you keep having, I'm going to have 10 children so that I have $50,000 a year or something. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think for, for me, um, the question of how do you um, support members of society who are not autonomous or can't be autonomous and make decisions for themselves, that kind of thing. Um, that's not a question that's really answered by basic income. Um, I think, you know, when we think about basic income, it's uh, people acting in their self-interest in the market as consumers, you know, buying what they want to buy, that kind of thing, which allows the market to allocate resources. Um, so I think, you know, uh, an infant is not, doesn't really fall under that umbrella. 
Um, and then also, you know, uh, adults who are also not autonomous, you know, they have their own unique problems that need to be addressed, uh, you know, in, in ways that are, are not just straight up basic income. Uh, so I would think of basic income as something um, for adults, autonomous adults, uh, and people who are, um, you know, have it phase in as people are becoming autonomous adults. Um, and and if there's if we want to provide child benefits, whether that's cash benefit or or other infrastructure resources and services for children uh, or families with children, um, those are maybe important things too. But I wouldn't kind of like lump that into uh, a basic income. I I kind of have that be a separate separate program or or basic income is kind of its own thing. Um, yeah. Uh, so. Brian says his final thought is the poverty ending UBI of $300 a week, $1,300 a month for adults, $100 for kids, everything over that is gravy. Uh, okay. Um, so I guess something that's over that would be, um, you know, some like $2,000 a month per adult, uh, unless you're having an insane number of kids, that's at least $100 per kid. Uh, so, so you wouldn't need to necessarily kind of include kids in, in the plan. Um, that would also qualify. So uh, great discussion, guys. Um, next week, we're talking about recessions and the business cycle. Uh, so that should be a fun one. Uh, Good thanks. Times. Yep. Thanks, last June as well. Uh, and then Bob.